Hello and welcome to Petrasys webinars. My name is Alkesta Belknap and I will be moderating today's webinar topic, Making Bubble Maps. This webinar will be recorded and uploaded to the Petrasys website in the next few days. Please keep in mind the webinar will last roughly 20 minutes. If you have any questions or comments throughout the webinar, please feel free to enter them in the questions panel as I will be keeping an eye on it throughout. All questions and comments will be answered at the end of the presentation. I would like to welcome Senior Technical Business Analyst from our Petrus' Houston office, Alec Kalingos, the presenter for today's webinar. Alec? Hello, everyone. Thanks for showing up. Uh, just quickly before we get going here, uh, just a quick agenda. We're going to have a, just a couple of seconds on discussing what exactly we're talking about when we say bubble maps, just so everybody's on the same page. Uh, the majority of the show will be the demonstration, of course, and we'll have a short summary. And then we'll spend as much time as anybody would like on a question and answer period at the end of the show. Okay, first off, what do we mean by bubble maps? The bubble maps are just essentially circles that represent some numerical value, the size of the circle obviously being representative of the size of the number. Um, you can have multiple numbers included in the bubbles, which essentially gives you a pie chart. And a typical example of this is oil, gas, and water ratios for wells, but you can use this for any numerical data. We also support um, elliptical bubbles, which can give you a directional component to your map. And don't forget, you can stack bubbles on top of one another and show some other bit of information that's varying. For instance, this is data varying over time. So with that, let's just get into the show. Uh, first off, how do you display a bubble map? You can use this shortcut icon right here that looks like a pie chart, or you can go to display bubble map. And the first thing you need to do is bring in some data to make a bubble map from. And we can bring in information from a variety of third-party data sources. And Excel and text files are probably the most common things that people make bubble maps from. But these third-party sources can be quite powerful as well. Now, if you don't see one of the third-party sources that you want to make bubbles from, for instance, uh, you might have data in a Petrel project or a Petra project, and you don't see it in this list, don't forget, you can use well data files. So the Petrasys data transfer tool, and specifically the well import wizard can be used to bring data into a well data file from any third party data source that we support. So if you don't see it in this list, your best option is to bring the data into a well data file and make bubbles from there. For today's show, I'm just gonna use Excel files. So the first thing you wanna do is pick some input data. I've just got a spreadsheet that has some oil, water, gas values and some lat longs. And don't forget, you can always click this format button. Your input data source does have to have some sort of a location for positioning the bubble. And you can pick whatever columns in your spreadsheet uh, to specify the locations. And the locations can be easting, northings, decimal degrees, lat longs, or degrees, minutes, seconds, lat longs. And then you want to have some numbers to make bubbles from. The next thing you want to do is go to this variable selection tab. And we can add what variables we want to have making up our bubbles. So, for instance, if I click Add, I'll see all the numerical columns and the input data. And I'll just add in my oil value for right now. The next thing you want to do is set the graphical attributes for that variable. So, if I click the Attribute button, uh, one thing we can do is we can color the bubbles based on a color gradient. You can specify very specific user-find ranges and um, apply colors to those. I'm just going to do something simple. I'm going to use the solid fill option, and we'll set this to solid, and I'm going to color my oil values in green. It's helpful if you use a translucency on these because bubbles can overlap with one another. Say OK, and that gives us our first just initial display. Let me drag it to the bottom of the map. Now, if we go back to that layer, I can start adding in some other variables. So I'll add my gas values. I will set the color fill for my gas variable to red, again, using a translucency. And I'm going to add in the water values as well. And we will set those to blue. And again, specifying translucency. Say okay to that, and that gives us an initial sort of a pie chart around everything. But if you'll notice, most everything is completely dominated by the red gas values, and I'll zoom in so we can see things a little bit more clearly. Uh, the reason why that's happening is because the data in my spreadsheet has not been really normalized over the same unit. So 
right now the gas volume needs to be adjusted to barrels of oil equivalent. So I can do that right here. Rather than just using the variable itself, I can click this and go to formula, and I can key in any quick kind of formula. So if I divide that value by six, just to convert it to barrels of oil equivalent, we get a slightly better display. Next. The annotations, um, you can post inside the pie wedges the name of the variable and the value, the name only, the value or only, or nothing at all. And if we go back and zoom down even closer, we'll notice it doesn't look very good, oil underscore volume, gas volume divided by six. So if you don't want to show the actual variable name, which is what it's showing right now, for each of these, I can go down here to this alternative posting. I'll key in oil for that one, gas, barrels of oil equivalent for that one, and simply water for that one. If you say OK to that, that gives a slightly better display on our annotations. Right now, the sizes are all set to a constant size. If we go back and modify the display parameters for that, the sizing is set here on the scaling parameters tab, and you can see I've got this set to a constant, and all of my bubbles are currently displayed at a 25 millimeter diameter. But you don't have to do that. You can, you can scale the size of these bubbles according to the total value that's summed up in these variables. And when you're thinking about sizing things, you really have to consider, are we talking about the diameter of the circle or the area of the circle. So for instance, if somebody says, I want my circles twice as big, if the number's twice as big, well, what do you mean by twice as big? I mean, it can be the area is twice the size or the diameter is twice the size. Also, we want to set up a distribution function. And what do I mean by a distribution function? You want to think of a graph, right? So here's a graph. And on my x-axis, I have the data values. This is the value coming from the variable selection list that I've added, my oil, water, gas number that's summed up. On the y-axis, I have the size of the bubble inside of millimeters. You always have a point at zero, zero. So essentially, if the, if the data value is zero, you get a zero bubble size, which is essentially no, no, no bubble at all. The user then specifies a second point on this graph, and you specify a value and a size through the interface. So these options down here, reference value and reference diameter, graph back up, are what's specifying the second point. So that's up to you as to where the second point is going to go. Next, you set a scaling type, and the scaling type can either be linear. If it's linear, you can get really large bubbles as this value gets large, the, the, the size of the bubbles can get unreasonably large as well. So you can kind of taper the size down by using a logarithmic distribution function. They'll both pass through both points on your graph, but logarithmic, it'll always increase the size of the bubbles as our value gets bigger, but it will help control bubbles that are too big altogether. So for instance, if I just set this to linear and scale it based on the diameter and hit OK, I get this just ridiculous looking display. So that's not going to work for me in this particular situation. I can say, well, what would happen if I set it to just the area? All right, that helps somewhat, but the bubbles are still pretty unreasonable and just really kind of wild. You can change the point to try to help this, and you can keep adjusting these values until you get something that's going to work for you. So for instance, if I set it to logarithmic to prevent those bubbles from just exploding, set it to diameter and hit apply, I get a slightly better display and go to area, hit apply. Again, it's getting a little bit better. Take this size down to, I don't know, down to 20, and maybe a little smaller, 15, I'll say okay to that. And that gives us a reasonable looking map. So that's how the raw interface works. Um, one other thing on the scaling parameters, you don't have to rely on these distribution function options. If you'd like, you can use scale against another variable, and in this way you can include things in your bubble, but control the size of the bubble according to something that's not in your variable list. And you can avoid everything altogether just by using use size categories. And in this option, it's pretty simple. If anything is less than 1,000, you can set the bubble size to 3 millimeters. Anything between 1,000 and 1, 
and 10,000, we can set it to another value, and on and on and on, specifying a user-defined sort of step function. Now, as another example, I'll just open up another map based on porosity values. All right, in this case, I'm um, creating bubbles, just one value inside the bubble, which is controlling the color. And if I go to my variable selection, you can see I'm making bubbles based on porosity. And I'm coloring the bubbles according to a gradient. This time, I'm not using the solid fill, using a gradient. So anything that has zero porosity is going to be purple. Anything with 10% porosity is going to be bright red. Also, the scaling parameters option, I am using this scale against another variable option. So I'm scaling the size of the bubbles according to the oil value column in my spreadsheet, but I'm coloring the things according to my porosity values. Another example of something else you can do is you can make elliptical bubble maps. And elliptical bubble maps can be quite interesting. So if you have some data that has a directional component in it, like perhaps fracture patterns, something like that, um, you can use this elliptical bubble option. And how are those created? And I kind of skipped over this little toggle at the top right of the display bubble map screen. If you have it set to circular, that's what you get when all the examples I've shown so far. But you can set this to elliptical. And when you set that to elliptical, this size tab changes. And the size tab, now that I'm under the ellipse mode, I can pick one of my columns to control the azimuth. And you do have to have a column in your data set that's going to specify the, the azimuth. And that's just normal map, map azimuth. The size of the ellipses can be controlled in two ways. You can pick just major and minor, in which case you can pick two columns from your input data. Um, this is in real world map sheet unit. So if, if your map sheet is in feet, uh, you'd have to have columns in this in the spreadsheet that would define the major axis in feet and the minor axis in feet. Or you can use this option, aspect ratio, and you can use one of your columns to define the aspect ratio. So for instance, I know my porosities are varying between one and about eight or nine. So if I'm just using the porosity to specify the aspect ratio. So the, the closer these things are to a circle, the closer my porosity value is to being one. Longer and thinner things, I have higher porosity values. As a final example, bring up this multi-year map. And these can be quite interesting. Don't forget, you can stack bubbles on top of one another. You don't have to vary the size according to any of the data. If we look at how this map is generated, I have several layers that are making bubble maps. And each one of these layers, I have a hard-coded constant diameter size. And we can zoom down in here. What are we looking at? We're looking at oil-gas ratios over years from 2008 to 2014. And they're very interesting, I think. For instance, this well, you can see water has been encroaching over time. And this is real data from the BOEM. Um, this is kind of an interesting well. I thought you can see water has been drastically increasing over time. And obviously, on this year, 2013, they tried to do something. And whatever they did on this well really increased the, the water production. And then they corrected themselves back in 2014 and have gotten back to a more sort of a reasonable production. And these, this idea of overlapping bubbles on top of one another um, can make really just, I think, very, very interesting displays and can convey a lot of information to the end users. All right. That's really the end of the demonstration. Um, go back. Just a brief final thoughts. Don't forget, bubble maps are just visual representations of numerical values. And the relative sizing of the pie wedges and the diameter quickly reflect the magnitudes of the numbers that you're using inside the bubble display. They're commonly used for oil, water, and gas ratios, but they can be used for any numerical values at all. Don't forget, you can also use ellipses. It can be really helpful if you've got a preferred direction in your data. And finally, these multiple overlapping bubbles can really be helpful as well. That's really all I had to say, but I'd just like to thank everybody for taking the time to view this, and we'll now cover your questions.